What I've done is try to create one example that ties them all together um, because they're really kind of disparate and, and disconnected. And, and I wanted something cool by the time we finish with this. So throughout chapter four, as we do our live coding, we're going to be creating um, two classes. One is called Caesar Cipher and one is called Caesar Cipher Demo. And we're going to start in Caesar Cipher Demo today. Um, the example I came up with here, uh, and I don't remember why I came up with this. I think maybe I was teaching cryptography and, and cybersecurity at the time, but I thought it would be cool to write a little program um, that performs the Caesar cipher. Um, a cipher is a way of like encrypting text or encrypting anything uh, to make it, to increase its confidentiality, to make it hard for someone else to read. The simple version of the Caesar cipher is called a, a rotation cipher. And, and that's a substitution cipher where every letter is replaced by a different letter. So if we have a rotation of like five, the letter A is replaced by A, B, C, D, E, B by F, C by G, so on and so forth. Um, just to be clear, the Caesar cipher is not a secure cipher. Please don't encrypt anything important using the Caesar cipher. We're going to do a more sophisticated version of the Caesar cipher called the keyed Caesar cipher. Um, I'm second guessing myself now. Let's look at the daily agenda here. Keyed Caesar cipher. Excellent. And I've got a link here to a whole site that lets you explore it if you're curious how it works. But basically, instead of just a rotation, um, there's a key phrase that we use as part of the encryption. To be clear, it is still not secure and don't encrypt anything important with our keyed Caesar cipher. But it's still a fun example, it's still kind of cool. In order for us to use our program, we need to interact with the user and we need to prompt the user for the text that we're gonna encrypt and for the key phrase. Um, most of the programs we're familiar with and the ones that we use on the classroom computers here and that you use on your Chromebook and that you use on your phone are graphical user interface applications, okay? What we're gonna focus on today are terminal-based applications um, where we're interacting through a terminal by typing text commands um, rather than clicking um, with a mouse or using our finger and interacting with with elements on the screen um, you've used the terminal when you installed blue j on your chromebook okay uh, and even though we don't use it a lot there are a lot of terminal programs out there that are pretty valuable so it's good for us to get a little experience of how to how we can write them all right, so how, how do we read from the BlueJ terminal? So let's describe a new class. And this new class comes with a lot of new terminology, which we'll define so that we can have this shared vocabulary um, throughout the year. So we're gonna use a new class called Scanner. A scanner object parses primitive types and strings from a stream. We are familiar with primitive types. Think int, double, boolean. We're familiar with strings. We're familiar with objects. But two new words here is parses and stream. Okay. We don't mean stream like um, running water, although that's a great analogy. But let's define what we mean by a stream in computer science. So a stream isn't a stream of moving water. A stream is a sequence of characters. This sequence of characters can come from many different places, which is why we use the abstraction of a stream. Um, we can have a sequence of characters from a file, um, from another string, from, a term from the terminal, like the BlueJay terminal, perhaps from a network connection, all of these are possible streams. What's cool here is that once we learn how to use the scanner object, we can read from all of these different types of streams. We don't have to learn a new object for files versus terminals versus network connections. That's great. All right, how about parsing? Um, I expect you to use the word parse in your communications art class when you refer to how you as a human read text on a page. 
Um, you parse characters into words, those words into sentences that have meaning. Um, when we use the word parsing in computer science, we actually mean the same thing, but it's not us reading, it's the computer. Um, so parsing is separating a sequence of characters into a new word here, tokens, based on another new word, delimiters. Ah, so many new words. It's okay, they're important. We use token because if we already use the word word, it wouldn't quite be accurate. Um, and what I mean by that is a token is a meaningful sequence of characters, like a word, okay? But it doesn't have to be a word. Um, our tokens might also have numbers in them. Our tongue tokens might have punctuation in them. Um, what is meaningful varies from one application to another, okay? If we're asking the user for input and we want to look at it word by word, then a token's just a word. Um, however, if we're reading a, a data file and there's a whole bunch of data in each column of data is separated by a comma, then a token might be any everything up to that next comma. Okay. And so what meaningful is varies from application to application. And the way that we can adjust what a token is, is by specifying the delimiter. So delimiters are characters that separate tokens. By default, and we're gonna stick with the default for this, this chapter. By default, the default delimiter is white space. What I mean by that is a space character, a tab character, a new line character, all of the, those are used to separate tokens. But in the future, when we want to read from a data file and we want all the data up to the next comma, we'll make our delimiter the comma and we'll get it. We'll do it that way instead. All right. Last thing we need to be aware of when we create a scanner object, we have to specify the input stream as like a, as an argument to the constructor. The input stream we're going to be using for this unit is system.in, which is the terminal input. So if we want the user to type in the BlueJ terminal or any terminal, we create a new scanner object with system.in. Here's what this looks like. Create a new variable of type scanner. I'm going to call my variable s, and it's going to equal a new scanner object and we pass system.in as the input stream argument to that constructor. There we go. Now the variable s refers to a new scanner object and I can use that scanner object to read from the terminal as the user type stuff. When you're designing graphical user interfaces, um, for apps, there's all sorts of design principles and best practices to enhance the user experience. Um, just because we're doing a terminal-based application here doesn't mean there aren't still best practices. There are still some. So let's, let's capture those, and then we're going to make sure we follow them in our program. Here are three best practices to improve the user experience. Number one, this might seem obvious, but I have run many programs that don't do this. Prompt the user for what you want them to input. I have run many programs where I run the program and the terminal cursor is flashing, waiting for me to type in something. And I have no idea what I'm supposed to do because the program never told me. Okay, So prompt the user for what you want them to input. Next thing that helps, use the print method, not the println method. What's the difference? Well, the reason why this matters is we is so that the cursor is at the end of the prompt 
and not on a new line. When we use println, it prints the string and then it goes down to the next line in the terminal to get ready to print something else. When we use print, it prints the string and leaves the cursor on the same line, which makes more sense as like a user we're about to answer the prompt. Question? Yeah, think of LN as print and then a line, print line instead of just print. And number three, this is just for aesthetics, but it helps. Leave a space after the prompt. Okay. So as the user types, it's not like what they're typing is right on top of the prompt. All right, here's what this looks like. An example makes this a lot more sense. System.out.print, not println. Enter the text to encrypt. So we're saying, here's what I want you to do. And I've left a space here between the colon and the double quote. Often when we're reading user input using the scanner, we do want to read it one word at a time, but sometimes we, we don't. We just want everything they type all in a single string all at once. Um, and so rather than forcing us to read it one word at a time and put it all together, the scanner class has a nice method for this. So we, when we say enter the text to encrypt, we don't want to read it word by word. We want the, all, the whole sentence or multiple sentences, whatever the user types in. So the method we use for this is the next line method. It returns all characters up to the end of the line. And what I mean by end of the line is like literally when or where the user typed enter. I don't mean the word enter, I mean they hit the enter key on the keyboard. It, it returns everything in the string up to that point. So here's what it looks like. String text equals s dot next line. I created a new local variable text of type string. I assign it the new string returned by calling s dot next line. That will give me all the entire sentence or multiple sentences that the user typed in and wants to encrypt. Our program is only gonna encrypt uppercase letters. So regardless of what the user typed in, let's convert it to make sure it's all uppercase. We learned how to do that last unit. I'm calling the to uppercase method on the string. It returns a new string, so I have to assign that back to the variable text. All right. This is good. We have the text to encrypt. Since we're doing the keyed Caesar cipher, we also need the key phrase. So let's prompt for that. System.out.print again. Enter the key phrase. And we're going to say no spaces. We're going to try to keep our program simple and we're going to assume the user does exactly what we want. It's important the key phrase doesn't have any spaces. We could write code that would have stripped out the spaces, but we'll just assume the user follows the rules. In this case, we don't need to read an entire line. We only need to read the next word. So we can use a different method on the scanner. The next method returns the next token in the stream as a string. That is perfect. Exactly what we want. So we'll create a new local variable of type string called key phrase, and we'll just say equals s dot next. And let's make it uppercase too. At this point, we have all the information from the user that we need to be able to encrypt their text and tell them what the encrypted text is but our program is also going to do some calculation. Um, it's going to say, hey, let's assume that someone is trying to crack this cipher by hand by just brute force, um, you know, trying just 
random combinations of um, key phrases. How long would it take for them to crack this thing? Okay. Um, and it depends on how fast they are or how many people are helping. So we'll actually prompt the user to get some information. So we're also going to do a system out print and we're going to say enter the number of seconds to test a guest key phrase. This is going to help us make that estimate. We could use the next method again and get a string. Uh, the user is going to type in something like three, and then we'd have to convert that string to an int. And we will learn how to do that. There are ways to do that. Um, but it's easier with a scanner. Instead of doing all of that ourselves, we're just going to use the next int method. The next int method attempts to convert the next token in the stream to an int. And then it returns the value. So if they type in three, it will return the value three as an integer, super convenient. However, watch out, if the next token cannot be converted, maybe they typed in banana instead of the number three, an exception is generated, okay? So that means we're gonna get a runtime error. Our program's gonna crash because they typed in banana instead of the number three. We will learn in the future how to deal with that, but for now, we're just gonna deal with the exception. There is another method called next double. Just so you know, behaves in the same way for doubles. There's also a next Boolean, okay? There's one for all the primitive types we care about. All right, so let's create a local variable called seconds per guess. And we'll say s dot next in. There we go. They type in the number three that gets stored in the variable seconds per guess. One other thing I want to show you, uh, this came up earlier today. I thought it was a good question. Someone asked, like concerning these two lines of code, hey, can I can I say s dot next and then immediately do dot to uppercase and get rid of this line? And the answer is yes, you can. Next returns, this returns a string, a reference to a string, which we can then immediately call another method on, which returns a string which we assign to this variable. If you're comfortable with this, I, that's fine with me. I will not be doing that because in my experience, when we start invoking more than one method on a line of code, we start getting confused about what's being returned, what types are at work and things fall apart. So I'm gonna stick to one method per line of code. If you wanna do differently, totally your call. All right, this is a great place to pause.